Okay, the book of Judges, please, and the sixth chapter, we're going to read from verse 11 down to 24, and we have a very simple title this morning. It's this, Lord, bring peace. Lord, bring peace. But that's a great prayer request in the world we live in, uh, where there's uh, much turmoil, uh, but you'll see why we've uh, titled it this as we read through this section, beginning in verse 11. It says, and there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the Abiezerite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us, and where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, Wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. And Gideon went in, and made ready a kid, and unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and brought it out unto him under the oak, and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh, and the unleavened cakes, mm -hmm. and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the flesh, and the unleavened cakes. Yeah. And there rose up fire out of the rock, and consumed the flesh, and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord. Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee. Fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom unto this day. It is yet in Ophrah of the Abiezerites. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word. And as we think about the Lord uh, bring peace, remember we said that the, the term Midian means strife. And of course, the uh, strife is a tremendous enemy of the people of God. Uh, so often uh, the Lord's people have been ripped apart by strife. And of course, it's only as a result of pride, only by pride cometh contention. And of course, whenever uh, Midian shows up, Amalek shows up as well, which is the flesh. And so you've got pride, uh, you have strife amongst the people of God and the flesh doing its work. And it's just devastating. And the prayer should be for every assembly, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord bring peace because we need peace amongst the people of God. And interesting this morning, just in my regular uh, consecutive readings uh, using uh, the M Murray McShane reading scheme. I was in Second Samuel this morning, and in Second Samuel uh, chapter two, Second Samuel chapter two and verse twenty-six, a verse that I read this morning. It really stood out to me, and and it says, "Then Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever?'" Knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then, ere thou bid the people return from following their brethren? And I just thought, that's an amazing statement, isn't it? Shall the sword devour forever? And it's, the tragedy is that the sword was devouring, but it was devouring God's people. There was civil war, 
in Israel between those that were following the house of David and those that were following Ishbosheth, who was Saul's son. And so the sword was being used, but it was being used against their own brethren. And it was devastating. And of course, uh, <coughs> the Lord wants us to use our sword, <laughs> but not against each other. He wants us to use it against the real enemy, which is Satan. And what a tragedy it is when the sword is devouring the people of God, when they're using it on each other uh, as a club, as it were, as a weapon <laughs> to beat the saints and to divide one another. And so we said that this chapter in Judges chapter six is really all about the, the pathway to genuine peace uh, amongst the saints, the pathway to genuine peace. How is that possible? How can that happen? And of course, uh, how can we overcome Midian, which means strife, Amalek, which is a picture of the flesh? And so as we jump into our passage, uh, we've already uh, looked briefly at chapter 11, where uh, after this unknown prophet comes and brings home the sin of the people, God now begins to raise up a deliverer. And it's this unlikely man called Gideon, the angel of the Lord, sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained to Joash the Abbey's right, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And we said last time that it's kind of a picture of how bleak situ the situation was, that this man Gideon is is down in the dust, as it were, because remember we said that, uh, that uh, th this uh, Ophra means dust or fawny, uh, and so down in the dust. And we, we also saw that he, in, he's trying to get some food for himself, and he's threshing wheat in the wine press. That's not the place you normally do it, but he's doing it because, as we read it, he's trying to hide it from the Midianites. And normally you would do it on a hilltop where the breezes would be there and the wheat and the chaff would separate very easily. But he's lower down the mountain and he's doing it in this wine press. But he's trying to get food for himself, this man who's down in the dust. And so I want to just kind of bring it home to us, really. What it's really saying is this. The way to defeat Midian or strife is by a lowly person who's a humble person, who's down in the dust, who's, who's in a small place and who knows how to feed himself in difficult days, knows how to get some food for himself in difficult days. And that's what we find with Gideon. And it's interesting that when there was the sword was devouring amongst the brethren movement. It started out as a tremendous testimony to the, the one body and to unity. And of course, the enemy couldn't bear to witness that marvelous testimony to one body. And of course, in the 1840s, 1848, there was a division that still is standing to this day, which is the exclusives versus the opens. And, and uh, of course, the enemy came in and had people who love one another with a pure heart fervently biting and devouring one another. And at that time, the only hope they had that there could be possibly a restoration and peace was found in a man who they all respected a man called Robert Cleaver Chapman. And they said, if anybody can bring these two sides together, it's this man Chapman. Now, why? Why him? Of all the, the great men that you read of that era, why Robert Chapman? Well, for the very reasons that we're looking at here, he was a man who had great humility. He was a humble man. And not only that, he was a man who knew how to feed himself the word of God. He was just the kind of man. Uh, sadly, uh, the Amalek was so prevalent at that time. The flesh was so raging that even the appeals of, of Mr. Chapman fell on deaf ears. But nevertheless, uh, we do say this, that there's a tremendous need today for humble men who know the book. They, they, they know how to feed themselves in difficult times. And they can be a great help to the people of God. And so notice verse 12, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. 
And it almost seems a ridiculous statement. Mighty man of valor? I mean, here's this man hiding, as it were, trying to hide his food in a wine press. Uh, you know, this, this is not what we would picture as a mighty man of valor. In fact, it's just the opposite. A man down in the dust, uh, <laughs> uh, hiding from the Midianites. Is this the mighty man of valor? Well, two things to say here. First of all, it's because of the first statement that Gideon is a mighty man of valor. The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And the only reason any of us could ever be used of God is because the Lord is with us. It's not because of who we are. It's because of who he is. The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And, and we remember how God has always used weak and foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And, you know, he picks the 12 uh, that he's going to use to turn the world upside down. And there wasn't a PhD student amongst them. I mean, they're just ordinary fishermen, tax collectors, just everyday, everyday kind of men. But the Lord said to them when he commissioned them, lo, I am with you always. In other words, it was the fact the Lord was with them. Here's Peter, a man who had failed miserably, denied the Lord with oaths and cursings. And yet he stands up with incredible boldness on the day of Pentecost and preaches in incredible power. But it's not his power. It's the power of the Spirit of God given uh, that can work through this, this man. Uh, who had been greatly humbled. And so, again, we can say that God is able to use us if we're small in our own eyes and if we're fully dependent on the Holy Spirit. And this is the kind of man God can use. And so <laughs> the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. The other thing that I want to say, the second point about this verse is that God saw potential in Gideon. Right? He saw what Gideon could be if he would depend on him. He saw that, and of course, the Lord is going to have to do a lot of encouraging and coaxing to get Gideon to actually believe that God can use him. But nevertheless, the amazing thing is that in each of our lives, it's a wonderful thing to think that we may think, how could ever God use a person like me? But he sees what we can be as we're yielded to him, and he sees potential for usefulness in every life that would be yielded to him. And so let's remember that. Let's remember that God, you know, I often remind myself, God delights to use the weak and foolish things of this world. And if that's the criteria, then Lord, I qualify because that's what we are, right? I mean, none of us are, are anything much. And God says, that's good because the only way that I get all the glory is if I use people who the world has never heard of. And that's what God, you know, there's not too many Christians in the who's who list of our world. Not too many, right? It's just ordinary people with an extraordinary God so that he gets all the glory. And so he says, <clears throat> The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Val valor. And Gideon said to him, O oh, oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all the miracles our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. That's verse 13. Again, what an amazing verse. What it tells us is that Gideon was well acquainted with God's ways in the past. He knew his history. He knew what God had done in the past. He was very well acquainted in his mind with God's great dealings in their deliverance from Egypt. He, he knew all this. And he also could recognize that the days he was living in, there was a disconnect between what was witnessed in the great power and deliverance from Egypt and what they were experiencing now. And, you know, it's a, it's a great thing in one sense for us to read church history. I, I love church history and, and I, I love reading the history of the church because what it does is that it, it brings the reality of our present circumstances to us. We see what God has done in the past and we see our present day and we say, 
Lord, it's not like that right now. Uh, it, we're in days of decline, historically. Uh, we're in days of departure in the day we find ourselves in. Many of us, if we're honest, we've witnessed assemblies getting smaller. Uh, we've witnessed less and less people getting saved, less and less people getting baptized. We, Many of us have known nothing but decline. But when you read church history, you read of days where God was moving, where there was a transformation of society and culture through the preaching of the gospel. And what it does to you as you feed on this kind of stuff is that it presents within you uh, a sense of a, a, a holy sense. And I, I mentioned the holy sense of dissatisfaction with the status quo. It, it doesn't give you a critical spirit. You love the Lord's people, but you, but you long for better days. And you begin to cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, you're the God of history. You're the God who has revived your work in times past. Lord, do it again in my day, in my generation. I want to see your mighty arm laid bare. I want to see uh, the great miracles that uh, former generations witnessed. Lord, I want to see that. And so <clears throat> he, he says, uh, Lord, <laughs> it's it kind of interesting. I just want you to notice a little kind of twist in the words here. In verse 12, he says, the Lord is with thee. So God is speaking to Gideon individually. The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And then when Gideon talks back to the Lord, he said, Gideon said to him, oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us. <laughs> and he includes his brethren. It's not just about him. He's including his brethren. Lord be with us. Why then is all this befallen us? Where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of saying, did not he, the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And so we see that this, this man is concerned with the wider picture. Yeah, the Lord is with thee, but, but Lord, if you're with me, but what about all of us? <laughs> What about your brethren? What, what about the brethren, Lord? We're, we're not where we should be. And I think any true servant is concerned not just for personal revival, but longs for the whole church to be victorious, cries out for God to work corporately, not just individually. Lord, I want you to work in my assembly. I want you to work in my community, in my country and i want you to do a great thing and so he he, he talks about us <clears throat> why has the lord forsaken us verse 14 it says and the lord looked upon him and said go in this thy might and thou shalt save israel from the hand of the midianites have not i sent thee and so Go in this thy might. Now, again, we might say, what might? <laughs> you don't see. But it, the idea is this. That God has now said, I am going to be with you. And that might that the Lord has is now being transferred to Gideon. Go in this thy might. And, of course, it's really uh, any work that's ever going to be done for the glory of God is going to be God working through us by his power by his spirit. It really is going to be a work that God does. And notice he says, uh, thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Now, God's going to say this several times to Gideon, and he's going to need to say it several times because Gideon is really struggling in believing that God is able to do this. And so the Lord gives him tremendous assurance. And so I want you to notice just with me verse 16 again the lord said to him surely i'll be with thee and thou shalt smite the midianites as one man look again at, at um chapter 7 and verse 9 and it came to pass the same night that the lord said unto him arise get thee down unto the host for i have delivered it into thine hand verse 14 he he hears a dream uh, that one of the uh, privates in the Midianite army had, and this is what it says, his fellow answered and said, this is nothing else save the sword of the Lord, uh, the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. And then again, verse 15, it was so when Gideon heard 
that telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped returned to the host of Israel and said, Arise, he finally got the message now, for the Lord hath delivered it into your hand, the host of Midian. But it took him a, quite a while to be convinced that God was going to use him to bring deliverance from the Midianites. He's, 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 he's struggling to really believe God's promise. And again, do we believe the promises of God? Do we believe them? Really, it comes down to that, really. Do we really believe the promises of God? It's interesting how the Lord has promised, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do we really believe that? See, these promises, they're, they're, they're really wonderful promises. But do we have the faith in the promises of God? And so Gideon took a lot of encouragement. Now, some of us need a lot of encouragement. But we can, I think a lot of us can relate to, to Gideon because uh, some of us just need a lot of encouragement. Uh, and uh, he needed a lot of encouragement, but the Lord was so faithful to provide the encouragement that he needed. So verse 15, it says, he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Gideon was a man who realized his utter weakness. Like the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, he considered himself to be less than the least of all the saints. And that's, that's good. That's a good place to be at, right? Remember we said the kind of man God can use is a man who's never heard of himself. It's a man who's a lowly man, a humble man, who's not thinking, oh, Lord, you're, you're so blessed to have me on your team. I mean, I've got so much talent to bring to the table. Uh, just move out of the way, Lord. Let me show you what I can do. That kind of person, God says, I can't use you. But here's a man who he, he just acknowledges, Lord, how could you use me? Uh, look at how weak I am. Look at, look at uh, you know, who I'm so inadequate. And so he says, uh, my family is poor in Manasseh. Interesting that he's got 10 servants that are going to help him uh, tear down the, the, uh, the idol. So uh, I'm not sure that he was being fully accurate uh, about being poor, but he says, uh, my family is poor in Manas. And then he says, I am the least in my father's house. I wonder, just wonder, this, I'm not being dogmatic on this, but I wonder was he considered to be the least in his father's house because maybe he didn't go along with the Baal worship that his father's house believed in. And so maybe he was looked down on because he didn't go with that. He didn't believe that, that he, he actually believed in Jehovah because he obviously knew about the miracles that our fathers told us of. And so perhaps that's the reason. But either way, he certainly had a, uh, a lowly assessment of himself. I find that very helpful. I mean, isn't that what the word of God says to us? Uh, after after Romans 12, present your body a living sacrifice uh, and then renewing your mind, the very next thing is not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think soberly. And so, again, we've got to have that right assessment. And I've often used the illustration of Dale Moody because, again, he was a shoe clerk. Uh, he was somebody who butchered the English language, and yet he heard somebody say, God is, uh, the world is yet to see what God can do with a man who is fully yielded to him. And Dale Moody said, by God's grace, I will be that man. And, and yet uh, he was a, a humble person. And R.A. Torrey said that uh, the thing that characterized him, why Moody was so usable was he had never heard of himself. He was just a lowly person. May God help us not to have too high an opinion of ourselves but to think soberly and to just realize who we are and realize who God is. And it's who God is that, that can make us usable and useful with all our frailty and all our weakness. And there's a certain sense in which each servant of God ought to be characterized by the humility 
that is displayed in Gideon and, of course, in the Lord himself. Remember, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Yes, God has chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. And the reason is that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now, it's amazing how patient the Lord is with Gideon. He reiterates verse 16. The Lord said to him, surely I will be with thee. And again, this is, this is the key. I'm going to be with you, Gideon. That's going to make the difference. And thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And the reason is because I'm going to be with you. Lo, I am with you all. So I'm going to be with you. And then it says, verse 17, he said unto him, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Now, again, what is Gideon thinking? Show me a sign that you're talking with me. Well, it's obvious he's talking with him. They're, they're having a conversation. Why does he need a sign? Well, he's going to need a lot of signs. And God is going to provide them. He's going to go uh, talk about going the extra mile. The Lord is going to go the extra mile with Gideon. He's going to meet him where he's at. He's going to encourage him every step of the way. And, and so he says, show me a sign that thou talks to me. And so verse 18, he lays it down. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. Again, we, we marvel at the Lord's patience. Now, how long is it going to take him to, to kill a kid and to cook the kid, right? I mean, this is going to be a, a, a process, making unleavened cakes, all of this, making the broth, you know, fastest case, at least an hour, but maybe longer. This is going to be a lengthy process. The Lord is willing to wait until his reluctant servant is ready. Isn't that, isn't that Lord so gracious? Isn't he amazing how patient he is with, with his people uh, and how often he's waiting for us to, to finally believe him and to finally accept that he is who he says he is and he'll do what he says he'll do. And, and he's so very gracious. So again, Gideon's offering now is brought before us. He says, depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, verse 18. And verse 19, Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. Now, just several thoughts here. First of all, remember, this is a day of food scarcity. Remember the Midianites, every time there's a harvest, the Midianites come, raid Israel, and they basically devour the land like grasshoppers. And even Gideon, remember, we find him in the wine press trying to get some food for himself. So clearly, food is not in an abundance. And yet he is bringing in these days, because it's a day of hardship, and a day of scarcity, he is bringing a very generous gift to the Lord. Uh, an ephah of flour, I'm told, is 30, 37 liters, a dry measure. I have no idea what that looks like, but it's it's quite, he it could have fed his family with cakes for quite a while. There's quite enough there in 37 liters. And, and so this ephah of flour, the, the kid, and then the broth, all of these things, which I'm sure would have been much appreciated uh, by him, but he gives it to the Lord. And again, you, you sense something in Gideon that you see later in David. David says this, I will not offer to God that which costs me nothing. And worship is costly. And are we willing to bring something that has cost us to the Lord? And so he brings these things. And of course, all of the, the offerings we just spent last week studying the Levitical offerings and, oh, what a rich time it was because uh, it's Christ in all the scriptures. And they all speak of different aspects of the person and work of the Lord Jesus. And the thought could be here that the unleavened cakes is the meal offering, speaks of Christ in lowliness of mind, his, his, uh, his perfect humanity as he walked here on this earth. And then the flesh of the kid, the burnt offering, uh, of course, uh, 
uh, <clears throat> the kid is the kid of the goats. And of course, of course, it speaks of the sure-footed one, the one that never put a foot out of step, but uh, the, his footsteps led him one place, and that was to Calvary. And he he literally was a, poured out his life out of his love for the Father. And so the burnt offering and then the broth, kind of this is a difficult one because normally the drink offering was wine, which symbolized joy. So I'm not sure what Gideon was thinking, but the idea was that the liquid would have been poured out on the other offerings, uh, upon the sacrifice, like Paul would say, uh, pouring out his life on the sacrifice and service of your faith. His life was to be poured out. And so all of it speaks of the Lord Jesus. And again, would tell us that perhaps Gideon didn't go along with his family. Uh, he knew about history. He knew about what pleased the Lord. And he was willing to bring these things. And notice as well, there's just a lot of lovely pictures here uh, because um, you, you have also uh, the rock and you have the rod and then you have the fire. And uh, again, all of these things conjure up beautiful thoughts in our minds. Uh, of course, uh, all reminders of Christ. He is the rock. Um, Jehovah lifted up his rod, or Christ, it fell on thee. Uh, the fire consuming uh, on the altar. Uh, uh, again, speaking of God's judgment in consuming uh, Christ as he was made to be sin for us. And so all of these things. And so he, he brings these things to the Lord. In verse 20, it says, the angel of God said to him, take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, lay them upon this rock, pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there arose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the leaven cakes. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said to him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. He realized he was in, in the presence of the angel of the Lord. Remember we said throughout this study, the angel of the Lord is the Lord, it, it's the eternal son in his pre-incarnate form, ever the one who reveals the Father. And uh, he realized he'd seen the angel of the Lord, and he, he wasn't dead. <laughs> and he, he thought, I, I should die. I'm in the presence of the one who is infinitely holy. And yet the Lord said to him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. And Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom, the Lord bring peace. And of course, the Lord Jesus is that peace offering, isn't he? He is the one that brings us to God. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the my favorite offerings is the peace offering. In a sense, you think about it for a moment. What, what do, do I, a sinner of the Gentiles, have in common with God in heaven who is thrice holy. Like we're, there's a distance here, isn't there? Where can we meet together? Is there any common ground between us? Well, there is. Now there is common ground. And that common ground is found in the Lord Jesus. You see, the father loves his son. And now because of Christ's redemptive work, I love his son. <laughs> and suddenly we have something in common, something we enjoy together, something we can talk about together, something that can bring us together. We're both in love with the same person. We both feed on him who is our life. And so it's wonderful to, to see that the Lord is our peace. And of course, what's even more interesting is, in one sense, we're talking about strife amongst the people of God, Midian meaning strife. And the way to defeat it, we've talked about humility, and we've talked about the whole idea of pride is the cause of strife amongst God's people. We've talked about the flesh and how that comes in. And we're trying to find solutions. And, and of course, the solution is having a humble mind. And another solution is being occupied with Christ and not yourself. And all of these, these offerings that he's bringing speak of Christ. 
an occupation with Christ is the great secret. If God's people could be more occupied with him, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the, the great uh, wheel illustration that the navigators has. And of course, in the middle, there's Christ, and then there's the spokes. And the closer the, the spoke gets to the middle, the closer they get to each other. Isn't that a beautiful illustration? The closer we get to the Lord Jesus, the closer we will become to one another. Because we will see more of Christ in our brethren. We, we love being together because Christ will be the focus. And so he says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Oh, how we need to have that Christ-like mind, how we need to be occupied with the person of Christ, not with self. Self-preoccupation is the cause of strife. Occupation with Christ is the way we find victory over strife. And so he says, the Lord bring peace. And of course, we've been thinking a lot about Philippians chapter two and how that, and of course, Philippians also is the epistle of peace. Chapter four talks about the peace of God. And then it talks about the God of peace be with you. And <laughs> Shalom here, Jehovah Shalom, according to Merrill Unger, it means welfare in its broadest connotation. It includes peace of mind, health of body, salvation of soul, comfort in distress, and success in life. So when everybody, when a Jew would greet another Jew and say, Shalom, he's, he's meaning more than just the enjoying peace, but all of the blessings and all the benefits that come from being at peace. And so in the midst of tumult that raged about him, in spite of the dreaded conflicts that were soon to take place, there was one place where all was at perfect peace. One person with whom there is no conflict, Jehovah himself. How beautiful and quiet is all this in the midst of utter ruin and confusion. Gideon has found the God of peace. And we see him here as an accepted worshiper, enjoying Jehovah Shalom, the Lord bring peace. So we're going to go from this place where Gideon is saying the Lord bring peace to a little bit of internal turmoil <laughs> that's going to occur because it says in verse 25, it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath and cut down the grove that is by it. So part of the reason the nation was in the condition it was in, he didn't have to look too far to find out why the Midianites were having victory in the land. Because even in his very father's house was the kind of idolatry that had brought this judgment. There was an altar to Baal, and then this word grove, remember we said it has the idea of a pole for Asherah, who was, as it were, the wife of Baal, all kinds of immorality connected with this. And, and his father was an all-out idolater. And so what Gideon has to do is live up to his name, because the name Gideon, it means a hewer, H-E-W-E-R, or cut her down, like a, we talk about somebody who's a ewer of wood. He cuts down wood, right? So, so the idea is this. He has to live up to his name, and the first task he's got to do is pull down or cut down the altar to Baal and the Asherah pole that is being worshipped in his father's house. And I want you just to notice uh, the emphasis on throw down, cut down here. Uh, so we see in, in verse 25, take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that is thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. Verse 28, when the many of the city, men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it. 
Verse 30, the men of the city said unto Joash, bring out thy son that he may die because he has cast down the altar of Baal because he has cut down the grove that was by it. End of verse 31, because one hath cast down his altar. Uh, end of verse 32, let Baal plead against him because he hath thrown down his altar. So clearly this, this section, it's, it's about cutting down the idolatry that was in his father's house. The cause of the discipline of God's people had to be removed before blessing could come. In other words, if we want to see revival, we have to ask the question, what's hindering it? What sin is being harbored in our hearts and in our houses that needs to be first cut down before God can come again in blessing? What is causing his discipline? What's causing uh, his disfavor amongst us? And so the idol has to be removed. And it would seem with this this altar, that perhaps even uh, Gideon's father was a local leader of Baal worship in that particular spot. Maybe this bullock, this second bullock that is mentioned here of seven years old that had to be used in throwing down this altar and then ultimately be offered as a sacrifice, uh, maybe uh, that bullock was being preserved for a sacrifice on the altar of Baal. Lots of things about the bullock I want to mention. First of all, notice it's a seven-year-old bullock. I want you to look back to chapter 6, verse 1. It says, The children did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Isn't that interesting? So as long as this bullock has been alive from the moment of its birth, the nation of Israel have been in bondage to the Midianites. And so its whole life, the whole seven years, it has lived during a time when the Midianites have held the people of Israel in bondage. <clears throat> also, it's the second bullock. Notice that. It's very interesting how the word of God tells us that the Lord Jesus is the second man. Remember, Adam was the first man. And the Lord Jesus is the second man, the last Adam. I like that. It's a wonderful thought, isn't it? There was um, every other human being was in Adam. <laughs> so he's the first man, and they're all in him. And now here comes the second man, the last Adam, the Lord Jesus. And isn't it wonderful when we got saved, we were moved from being in the first man, Adam. And we found ourselves in the new man, that is Christ the second man, the Lord from heaven, the risen man. We're connected with the risen man, no longer the man that brought death and sin and bondage, but we're connected with the second man, the risen man. Again, we think of uh, this idea of the second again, that uh, uh, the Lord talks about the old covenant, and he says he takes away the first that he might establish the second. <laughs> that marvelous covenant the new covenant that is grace oriented rather than performance and law orientated, Hebrews 10 and verse 9. And so, what we find here is this God cannot tolerate any rivals. And therefore, two altars could not possibly exist side by side. Before the Spirit of the Lord could come on Gideon, he had to destroy the idols that were hindering blessing. Idols had to be destroyed, had to be torn down, to be cut down, to be hewed down before the Spirit of the Lord could fully come upon Gideon. And again, are there idols in our life that is hindering the fullness of blessing and usefulness? Are there things that we need to deal radically and drastically with and cut down before God can fully fill us with his spirit and use us to cause victory and defeat the enemy? Notice that he's a bit concerned about this, and uh, he, he does it, but he does it at night time. Uh, he doesn't do it in the daylight. <laughs> and so he, he 
<clears throat> he's instructed, verse 26, build an altar to the Lord after you've torn down this other altar, thy God upon the top of the rock in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove. So he's actually going to use the wood of the grove, the wood from the Asherah pole, which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. Nevertheless, he did it. Yeah, he did it secretly. He did it at nighttime. He didn't, you know, he, he still, fear is still kind of gripping him, uh, uh, Gideon. He's not got to the point where we're going to see that fear gone. It's going to take a while. The law is going to have to do a lot more encouraging of his servant before the fear is dissipated. So he's acting in fear. He's acting in weakness. Yet, nevertheless, he destroys those idols in silence without being observed. And we, we, we might say this. The overthrowing of idols is the secret of power. It's then the spirit of Jehovah comes upon Gideon when he completes this act. Look at verse 34. But the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and Abiezer was gathered after him. It would be a, a terrible inconsistency for a man going to deal with a heathen enemy while Baal worship was in his father's house. Before Gideon could declare war on Midian, he had to declare war on Baal. And it's true, in a sense, you know, we, we have an excise in the gospel, and we want to have a gospel series. But we have to ask some hard questions first. The first question we have to ask is, before we tell the world to be reconciled to God, are we reconciled to one another? See, it's hard for them to be serious about being reconciled to God if in our assembly we're fighting and biting and devouring one another like wild animals, right? How could we expect them to be reconciled to God if we won't be reconciled to one another? If we're not serious about dealing with sin in our lives, how can we expect an unsaved person to be serious about dealing with sin in their lives? They're going to just say, well, put your own house in order first, and they'd be right. Yes, put your own house in order first. And so Gideon has to deal with the problems in his own house before he can deal with the nation. What idols are lurking in our homes that have caused such famine conditions among the people of God? And there are lots of things that can be idols in our home. Our work can be an idol. Entertainment can be an idol. Family can be an idol. It's interesting that when he goes ahead and does this, we notice what happens. It's kind of amazing, really. It says, <clears throat> verse 28, when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, the grove was cut down that was by it, and the second bullet was offered upon the altar that was built. They said one to another, who had done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. Now, how did that get out? Well, of course, he's got 10 people helping him. And when you have 11 people, somebody's going to speak at some point. And so obviously word got out. And the men of the city said to Joash, bring out thy son that he may die because he hath cast down the altar of Baal and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. Interesting. Gideon is supposed to be killed. It was considered a capital offense at that point to destroy Baal's altar. When actually Deuteronomy 13 would tell us that Baal worship was the capital offense. <laughs> that having an altar to Baal was punishable by death. And again, his society was a bit like our society. You remember how government is supposed to punish evildoers and reward the good? In so much of our society, evildoers are lauded and put on a pedestal, and those that do good are treated despicably. And that's what's happening in his day. It, it shouldn't have been Gideon that were put. They should have been put to death. The idol worshippers should have been put to death. But notice um, that 
Verse 32, therefore, on that day, he called him Jeroboam, saying, let Baal plead against him because he has thrown down the altar. But notice what Joash does in verse 31, and with this we'll have to close. It says, Joash said unto all that stood against him. This is the man whose idol had been torn down by his own son. And this is what he says. He says, will you plead for Baal? Will you save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it's yet morning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. And so what the amazing thing is that it actually it actually t- teaches a lesson to Gideon's father, Joash. And the lesson is simply this. What kind of god is Baal that he can't even defend himself? And he realizes, what folly. I've been worshiping Baal and Asherah, and my own son pulled it all down, and Baal didn't lift a finger in defense. And isn't it good how sometimes when somebody takes a stand for the Lord and it it causes others to, to, people are looking for examples to follow of people who who are serious about dealing with sin, serious about putting down idolatry, living lives of holiness, living lives of zeal for God. People will follow that kind of example. And so Joash, it's almost like a wake-up call to him, and he realized, what folly. I've been worshiping this, this incompetent deity that can't even defend himself. <laughs> and so Gideon's stand for God had a great effect on others. You know how it affects others when we stand for the Lord. May God encourage us to take stands for him today, to pull down any that are hindering us. Amen.